yesterday we learned about the uh, translation of a Pasuk in Misle, translation of a, a Pasuk in, in Pro Proverbs, that it says there are three things that are never satisfied. The grave, which means the earth is never satisfied. The oitzer, rechem, and the narrow, the narrowness of the, uh, the narrow path of the womb is never satisfied. And the, the earth is never satisfied with water. And the Gemara tried to compare the womb with the grave. Why is the womb equal compared next to the grave? And the Gemara said that the reason it's compared to it is because that just like the womb, it takes in, which means it takes in seed and it gives out a baby. So also the grave, it, although people die, but they will come out, they will come back. The resurrection of the dead will happen. And that's the meaning of the verse. The verse is emphasizing that Tachias HaMason, the resurrection of the dead is clearly written in the, or it's clearly hinted to in the, uh, in the writings, in the Mish, in the book of Mishlev. So then the next the next uh, Gemara talked about Uchsavtam, that it should be written even the commands should be written in the tefillin and in the mezuzahs. And what that means is that you might think, I don't have to write down the, the, the fact that it says I should write this down, I have to write down what it says to write down. I don't have to write down the sentence that it says, write this down. That sentence, write this down, is not necessarily meant to be written inside the, uh, the, inside the paragraph. And the Gemara says, yes, it is. It is meant to be written inside the paragraph of the mezuzah, inside the paragraph of the tefillin. It should be written there, included in there. The question is, how do we know this? So the Gemara initially says, from the word, ochsavta. Here it says it should be written, the Kosav Tam should be written completely. So it's adding something. So it's telling you that even the Tzava, even the command should be written in the mezuzah and in the tefillin. You should write this on the door, on your doorpost. It should be written also in on the doorpost itself. That sentence itself should be written as well. And the Gemara then uh, brought a, a case of uh, a Saito, which is a case where a woman um, has to drink certain water called the Saita water. And that water is a question in the, in the, in the Mishnah, the different difference of opinion between a few rabbis as to what exactly was written and then erased into water. It was dissolved, the writing was dissolved and they would write something on parchment and then the writing would be dissolved in water. And so there's an argument as to what verses were actually written in the, uh, on this parchment and the, um, the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda is brought in our Gemara. Rabbi Yehuda says over there that you don't write the command to write this in the, in the, the command. You only write down what you're supposed to write, uh, the curses and so on. And so the Gemara initially says, well, our Gemara says, our, our case, I should say, not our Gemara. Our case says, which means, it should be written completely. And Saita, it doesn't say that. And therefore, you didn't have to write down the commands. But the Gemara says is the reason why you don't write the commands by Saita. You don't write the obligation, the, the commandment in the, in, on the parchment by Saita. Is because it says, v'kosav, and it doesn't say, uchsav tam, which means... Uh, uh, complete completeness. You should write it in its completion. Uh, is that the reason? The reason of Rabbi Huda is because it says specifically write down the curses. It adds the word curses, meaning it's clarifying there not to write down the command. So the Gemara says, you're right. The reason over there is because it says Olois. And it's specifically the curses are supposed to be written, meaning the punishment over there, you write down on the parchment, you have to write down that the woman's body will explode if she drinks this water 
and so that's the the curses and um, the, uh, the the obligation of erasing this in the water you don't have to write down and it's how do we know that because it says specifically alois only the curses you have to write down and the gemara says but you might think that we should learn our case from that case that just like there you don't write the command here also on the mezuzah and on the tefillin you shouldn't write you shouldn't have to write the sentence about the command and therefore it says that even the commands you have to write down in the tefillin and in the mezuzah so our Gemara just taught us a law about tefillin and mezuzah that you have to write down also the pasuk uchsavta, uh, that you should write it. The obligation to write it is, is uh, it's also supposed to be written. Okay, now we're up to the next Gemara. And um, I should mention David uh, yesterday uh, had asked a, a good question about coming to a shear. And you didn't say if maybe that would be uh, considered more than just thinking about divrei Torah. And um, uh, and others also wanted to agree with David. And the truth of the matter is, it seems like David is correct. That, uh, but not because of his reason. Uh, the reason is because there's a law in Torah. That shemeya koina. When you hear something, it's as if you're saying it. So normally, there's a mitzvah to recite words of Torah when you learn, instead of just reading with your eyes. There is a mitzvah to put the main mitzvah of learning Torah is to recite it. And therefore, if you think about Torah, you do not need, according to the letter of the law, you don't need to say, you don't need to recite the blessing before that. Nevertheless. If you go to a shear and you're listening, so listening is considered in halacha like saying it. And therefore, uh, that's why there are certain, uh, if you're in the middle of, uh, uh, of davening and you can't answer a certain replies, you, if, you, if, you, if, you, uh, if you listen, it's considered as if you said it. So therefore, uh, the same thing applies in learning Torah. And therefore, it's... Uh, it's um, uh, appropriate to recite the uh, before you come here. So thank you, David, for uh, Clara for uh, bringing that up. Again, it's not because of listening, and listening takes more uh, more uh, um, energy, or you have to you know be attentive. It doesn't say that reason. The main reason is because the, the reason that I saw abroad is because shemeya koina. If a person hears, it's as if he's saying it, and therefore a person should recite. Divrei Torah for a year. Okay, now um, the next Gemara is five lines up, six lines up from the bottom. Tani Rav Avadya Kamei De Rav. Rav Avadya learned in the uh, before Rav. Vili Madatem. It says, and you shall teach them. So the Gemara learns from that word, Vili Madatem, Sheyeheli Mudchatam. It's like a combination of two words. Vilimadatem, your limud, your uh, study of it should be tam, should be correct, should be perfect. And that means sheyitain revach bein hadvekim. You should give space between the words that are attached to each other and might or might become attached to each other if you don't separate between them. There are words that, um, that would, 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 naturally be read together and therefore you have to be careful to separate uh ani rava basre so rava answered after him kigoin for example al levavecha now what happens if you read al levavecha it would sound like one word al levavecha like one lamed and because it's two words but it has the same letter that ends the, the first word and the beginning letter starts the second word, it would sound like one word. Bechol levavacha. Bechol levavachem. Esev besadacha. Ba'avadatem mehedra. Hakonach pesil. Eschem me'eretz. All of these words have the same letter before and the same letter after, and therefore a person should be careful to say the words properly uh, as we said in the Mishnah, the Mishnah said a person should be careful. The person didn't say the letters, the, the letters clearly, 
he didn't um, enunciate the letters properly. So uh, th there was an argument in the Mishnah if he fulfilled his obligation. But even if you fulfilled your obligation, it doesn't mean you shouldn't try to do it uh, the proper way. And the proper way we learn from the that you should you should say it in a uh, in a clear way. And this is brought in Shulchan Aruch that a person should say Shema and separate. Be careful when they're saying words that would could be read as one. <laughs> Now, Reb Chama Reb Chanina says something nice about how something, uh, uh, how uh, the the reward, so to speak, for uh, uh, the the fringe benefit of saying uh, Shema, being careful with saying the words clearly. That if a person says it in medactic, he's careful with the oisios with the letters. Mitzanin and Gehenim. They they cool off Gehenim for them. Say that again, please. They cool off hell. Okay, that means that he could go to hell and that it's not going to be painful to him because they cool off the fire. Okay. They, make, they make it more bearable. And the, the question is, does it mean more bearable or is it completely cooled off? She looks aged. And I mean, she I did see she one of the best she could for us. Um, she had on the couch. Okay. okay. Uh, the, uh, I, I, I think the common understanding is it actually is cooled off, like it, it's not painful at all. But I, I think I saw that somewhere. Um, let me just see if this Gemara says clearly. Um, On the Stein salts, it says something about snow, that it will snow in Zalman. No, no, that's maybe the next Gemara. Okay, I'm sorry. I apologize. That, that's the next line, excuse me, not the next one, the next line. But Metsanin and Lai Gehenim, over here it has a commentary, just looking. Very complicated. <laughs> okay, so I see one of the commentaries explains that we're talking about a tzaddik that's passing through Gehenim to benefit, he's passing through hell for his relatives that already almost received all of their punishment and he pulls them out. He's able to pull them out to Gan Eden. And when he travels there, he feels some of the pain. But if he was careful for uh, uh, reciting the, the, this is very interesting, this, this explanation. Uh, but if he's careful to say Shema clearly, so he doesn't feel the pain at all. Very interesting. So what it, what it says is there's such a concept as you could be on parole, like the, you could get out early. And uh, if you have a relative who's a tzaddik or a connection, they could try to come and get you out. And the thing is that when they go to get you out, it could be painful for them to go through, just go walking through. Walking through the, the, the hell is also painful. And so uh, th this is what the Gemara is saying. If you are careful to say Shema very clearly, then you won't have to feel that pain of the, um, while you're passing through to, uh, to, um, uh, to, to, to bring out your relative. And what's the connection? Since a person awakens himself to read it, uh, and, and warms himself to read it, um, um, uh, to read the, the Shema carefully. So therefore, his reward is this warmness of, of, of hell is cooled off from him. Or since he reads it slowly, they also 
wait for the, the hell to cool down from its from its heat. Anyway, these are just explanations. It's not necessarily that's the only explanation. That's one explanation. The other explanations is even if he's obligated to go to hell, they they cool off the the warmth of the heat, and uh, which maybe means it's it's bearable or it's completely cooled off. It doesn't say clearly to what extent it is. We don't have a, a thermo. We don't have. It doesn't say a measure exactly a uh, um, a temperature. Uh, uh, for for hell, we don't know exactly how hot it is initially. We don't know how hot it is, uh, um, you know, after it's cooled off. But it's definitely worthwhile uh, re reciting Shema uh, slowly and uh, with uh, in, in, in separating in between these words. Yes, uh, Ben. Ben, I think maybe it depends on how well. You you made that deck about to you. Uh huh. Okay. The temperature goes by how how well you're doing. Uh huh. Right. Okay. Because okay. there could be a different degree in reading the Shema. You know, uh -huh. not just perfect. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. That's Sounds... why they don't tell you the temperature. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, uh, Rabbi. Maybe yes, David. I had a question <laughs> for Ben. What's the what's the difference between mitzanin mitzanin to cool off and karcha to cool you off. What's the difference between mitzanin and kar and kar 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 kof reish to cool you off? Kerach means I. is cooling. Mitzanin is also cooling, but karcha maybe it's kerach, which is ice. Yeah. So ice would be cooler than mitzanen. Yeah, I'm not sure because the word karcha is with a chaf, not a not a ches. And I think kera. Oh, it's not. Is, is I didn't with see a it written. Yeah. So I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, if I that, didn't see if it that, written. If that's uh, correct. Okay. Uh, we're going to continue with the next piece. Uh, the, oh, the, the Gemara gives a reason. Shana, uh, Gemara gives a source. Shenamar, we're two lines up from the bottom of the page. Test Vav Ahmed Base 15b, two lines up from the bottom. Shenamar, as it says in the verse, before Shakai Malachim, when Hashem distributes, spreads out the kings, Ba in Israel, Tashleg Betzalmoin. The those that are in shadow darkness are whitened. Something like that. Those that are in <coughs> But Tashleg, but Salmon. Salmon means like shadows. Those that are in shadows will be Tashleg. will be white yeah. like snow. Will be white and like snow. Let me just make sure I'm translating it correct. Yes. Yeah. Tashleg is snow. Yeah. The shadows. So, uh, So that uh, so that's the simple meaning of the verse. But the Gemara says, "Al tikri befares, ella befares." Don't read it when he scatters, but read it befares when he clearly enunciates, when he spells out, when he says clearly. "Al tikri betsalmain, ella betsalmaves." Don't read it in the shadow darkness, but read it salmaves, which means uh, which refers to hell, which is. Uh, um, the word Salmavas. Okay, so um, like the shadow, it, the shadow of death. So um, sale. It's two words. Salmavas is a is a combination of two words. Sale and Mavas, com, uh, shadow of death. So uh, how do you read the verse now? So you have to read the verse. The Fares Shakai when you spell out. Hashe, accepting the yoke of heaven, meaning in the Shema, when you spell it out clearly, when you say it very clearly, Melachim <clears throat> Ba uh, Tashleg, the, uh, the, the Torah, which kings, um, um, that kings are appointed from, or follow, rule, rule by, the, the, the Torah that kings rule by, they will, it will um, cool off, Malachim ba 
the, the Torah that kings rule by, Tashleg Betzal Maves, they will cool off the, the, the heat of hell. So that's how you translate the verse now, that if you clearly say the words of the Shema, you're, they, they, they will cool off the, the heat of, of, of Gehenna. Okay. Rav Chama Rav Chanina says, Lama nismuchu ayhalim lenachalim. Next, next page, Tes Zion. We're now on page 16a. Why is ayhalim, uh, tents, next to the word nechalim, uh, streams? Kin nechalim nitoyu? Like nechalim, like streams are stretched out. Kiganois ale nahar? Like gardens by a river. Kaholim nata goimer? Like tents that he pitched. So this is a verse in Bamidbar. It's uh, talking about the Jewish people uh, dwell, their dwelling. And it says that the Cholim, it uses the word the uh, uh, streams next to tents. And so why does it compare um, uh, uh, tents to streams? Loimar Lucha to tell you man Cholim just like a stream, which could be Sometimes used as a mikvah, a stream of a natural stream could be used as a mikvah, um, just like a stream could could take a person out from impurity to purity. Af adam. Also, the oihel, which means a base medrash, a house of study, uh, uh, could be uh, elevate someone malin as adam mikav chayva from being. Um, found guilty to being uh, innocent. So which means that a person through learning Torah and through studying in the base measures, they're able to elevate themselves, not only because the time, not only because they're, they're spending their time doing the right thing so they won't end up being found guilty, but also their values will change, that the Torah will have an effect on them and it'll, it'll influence them to, um, you know, to, to, to see things differently, to see things in a holier way. Now, the truth of the matter is, that it really depends on how a person learns. If a person is learning totally for selfish reasons or for um, certain reasons, it could be that the Torah uh, may, you know, may not have the, the effect that it's supposed to have on the person because the person is simply learning Torah for, you know, for other reasons and not for sincerely because he wants to connect to Hashem in the greatest way, which is through Torah study. So therefore, a person has to, uh, a person has to, um, number one, evaluate themselves. Is this, is the Torah helping? Am I, maybe I'm not learning Torah properly. <laughs> or uh, why isn't it taking me out of the way I used to be and to taking me to a holier way of learning Torah? Uh, uh, there is a statement in the Gemara, uh, in the Medrash, excuse me, that says, Halavai, I wish, Hashem says, I wish, Oisi Ozbu, Ozbu Betairasi Shamaru, I wish that they would, uh, they would forget me, Hashem says, let them forget me and just keep my Torah, which is a very shocking statement that Hashem would say, like, I don't mind if they don't serve me, just study my Torah. And the Gemara says, why? Because, Shehamor Sheba Machziroi Lemuto, the, the light of the Torah will bring them back to good. And therefore, even if they forget Hashem, but at least they're studying Torah, so the Torah, the light of Torah will bring them back, will bring them back to the Torah, to bring them back to Hashem. So ultimately, they'll come back. The only thing is that as well, that, that, that point, it, it, you know, it, 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 it's when you study Torah with some type of a sin, sincerity or you have mazel that it has a good impact. Uh, because you could have Torah, Torah study is also the Gemara in other places says that the Torah could become like a poison. If a person learns Torah not for the right purpose, there's the Gemara that says, Nasalai Sam Hamavas, it becomes a poison, a poison of a, 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 a fatal poison. And, uh, and um, <coughs> that, uh, it would have been better that he wasn't born. Uh, so there are statements in the Talmud that you see, uh, you know, that go both ways. So here the Gemara is saying how the Torah and uh, studying Torah in a an oihel, which means uh, in a tent of Torah, so you uh, it can it can benefit you, it'll influence you.
to change from a way of the guilt to, to a uh, literally a, a kaf, a palm of, of, of merit. Okay. Could I ask a question? Yes. Please, I, uh, you're talking about the reason to learn, to read the Torah and to learn about it. Suppose like our class, somebody... our class, uh, many people uh, are here learning Torah. We have a nice crowd and everyone wants to connect to Hashem. And even though we might give a stipend to those, you know, but that's like a, a like a fringe benefit. We hope that no one's like only learning because they're making some money. That's like, a, you know, it's like a side little thing. They're doing some essay. They're writing essay. You know, they're, they're coming on time. But the, uh, you know, it's not that, oh, I'm only studying person. Sure, that would that would be wrong to only study because uh, this is uh, this is my my business now. I'm, I, you know, okay. I'm only doing it because, look, I'm, I made of this money and, uh, you know. Okay, uh, but know. what if what if a, a rabbi is studying Torah so that he can control his people? So it depends. Again, it it it, it boils down to the fact that does he does he uh, study Torah because you know he wants to connect to Hashem and of course he needs to make a living, or he needs to you know he has to get paid for his time. But his main his his goal his interest is not uh, you it know just. Be. It shouldn't right. be selfish interests, you know, just to get that honor for being a rabbi, you know, that's, uh, he wants the honor. So people will think that he's knowledge, you know, that's not the appropriate way to, 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 to teach, to, to, to give a, you know, to, to, to teach Torah in an honorable way for Hashem. If he's thinking this is to honor Hashem, I want to have, I want to give a good class because this is going to be honorable okay, so to does, Hashem. Or, does one rabbi tell another one, you're doing it for the wrong reasons? If they're very angry at them, they could. Uh, it's it's not commonly. We don't normally uh, scream at other rabbis, but uh, uh, if someone was very angry, maybe they would say something like that. You know. Wow. Uh, there are cases in the Talmud where we assume that they learned, like they were very knowledgeable people, and we assume that they learned for the wrong reasons. For example, Achitayfel Doyegadoymi. There were some Kairach. Kairach was a rebellious person. And he uh, learned, we, we assume he probably learned Torah for the wrong reasons, because how could he have been such a, you know, so, so rebellious and, and, and yet, you know, and yet been so knowledgeable, it's just, you know, shocking. So often we'll, we'll, we'll you know, we'll assume that must, must be that they had some type of a... Uh, uh, Mental illness. Well, a, a selfish reasons for mm -hmm. their, their okay. Torah study. But, you know, we hope that's, it's not, that's not the common understanding. We hope that's not the common way of people right. who study Torah. So, so here, the, the, the idea is that the Torah is supposed to be, we're supposed to, it's supposed to have a influence on, e on each of us and uh, to, to make us change. So that's, that's, the, uh, that's really the lesson here, that when you learn Torah, we should feel that we are... Uh, being inspired and uh, and wanting to um, be more refined and, and better people. Now the the Gemara continues and it says, Rab Rabbi, yes, I just yeah, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, I used to live uh, with a uh, me and my wife used to live in, a, in an apartment uh, with a very senior uh, Chabad Chassid in another town, uh -huh. and he was a teacher in the local uh, Misnag Bishop School. He was one of the senior teachers. And he once remarked to me in frustration that he feels like he's coming home every day after hours and hours of sitting with these Bachrim, these students learning Gomorrah. And he felt like they're, they're learning Torah, but they're afraid of getting about Hashem, he said to me. He said uh -huh. they can go the whole day and they don't mention Hashem. They're just learning Gomorrah and Gomorrah and Torah, and they don't mention Hashem at all. So he uh -huh. was very frustrated over the situation. Uh -huh. So did he say like what he did to try to change that? No, he had been at the school for decades, and it was just the uh, settling in of this of the uh, approach, I guess, of the students. He was very. He said to me in frustration. He was already, you know, in his uh, elder years, and he uh -huh. was uh, interesting. And he was very frustrated. Wow. I'm just surprised because there is something called the Musser movement, and most of the yeshivas they study Musser. Uh, maybe what was he like? A elementary school, or was it a high school? I think it was an elementary school. Oh, so maybe that's uh, why. Uh -huh. Yeah. 
because the high but schools like, you know, normally have a musser seder, and, and normally they, you know, they talk about self refinement, and I, I can't say they 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 think about Hashem as much as you find in Hasidus, but it's definitely you know a little more. Uh, you know, but but elementary schools don't normally have the Musar Seder, and they do have the Gemara all day. They, they don't Actually, have, you know, the, they don't have the Musar. So yeah. that could be more of a, an issue. And interesting. In any event, the yeshiva, um, the yeshiva was an Eitz Chaim Yeshiva, and they had all these things mm-hmm. hanging on the walls about Savlanut and all this Musar stuff. I uh, was all over the place. But he no, said, no, but in eight... Musar, you you find the you know Hashem's name mentioned more. Like in the Gemara, you don't find Hashem mentioned so often as you find like in Chumash. So people who learn Gemara all day, you know, they don't have the, they don't feel that relationship with Hashem always if they get too involved into the depth of the Gemara and thinking about their own thoughts. So you don't always, you're not always mentioning Hashem, but in Musa, you definitely have, you know, Hashem mentioned where it comes up. But it's an interesting uh, um, observation that maybe uh, in our elementary schools, um, uh, you know, I, do we think, do we, do we teach this enough? I think that's a good point, uh, David. Do we emphasize enough uh, our, our purpose of learning, learning for Hashem? The, the, the problem a little is that, you know, when, when, when we, but with children, we do encourage children to learn for selfish reasons. They're going to get a, 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 an ice cream. They're going to get a chocolate. They're going to get this. They're going to get money. They're going to win some uh, a pile of, of sperm. So it's not totally wrong. See, the, what's interesting is the um, the Gemara, um, the Gemara in two, uh, in the Gemara uh, net on the next page. It really talks about this. That it says there's one place. It says uh, Tais was asked a question. He says uh, one place. Our Gemara on the next page says that a person who uh, does Taira better, he shouldn't have been born. Another place, he says, that a person should learn Torah even for the wrong reasons, because ultimately he'll do it for the right reasons. So Taisva's answer is that there's uh, a difference. If you learn it in order to be honored or to, uh, you know, if you learn it for, for honor, then it's, it's okay because you'll ultimately do it for the right reason. You'll realize that the honor is not really getting you, you know, you too far. and You'll ultimately do it for the right reason. If you do it to bother people and to, you know, to, uh, to fight with people and, uh, tease people and you know if you do it for the wrong reason then then it's better he shouldn't have been born so it comes out that it's you know the fact that the yeshivas don't really do it so much maybe in the elementary school yeah you know you have to take that with a grain of salt because it it is you know it's part of the education of how we start we, we have to in, 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 entice the children we have to uh, give them some attract them to taira even for not for the highest level for the highest reasons, but um, in any event, it's an interesting observation that you uh, that you brought. Okay, let me continue on the next piece of Gemara. Hakayre <laughs> lamafrei layotz. If a person read backwards, he did not fulfill his obligation. Rab Ami, Rab Asi, have a kokatrin lay gnana the Rebbe Lazar. Rab Ami and Rab Asi were tying a canopy, a chupa for Rebbe Lazar. Rebbe Lazar was going to get married, and uh, they were tying the uh, the uh, the chupa together. And uh, Rebbe Lazar, uh, you know, Amar Lahu, so Rebbe Lazar said to them, uh, in the meantime, I will go and I'll listen to a word in the base medrash, and I'll come and I'll tell you back. In other words, what am I doing here sitting, hanging around while you both are, are busy trying to uh, figure out how to attach this chuppah together? Let me go in the meantime, I'll go down the road. There's a base medrash over there where they have students studying Torah. Let me go there and uh, I'll hear some words of Torah. I'll come back and I'll tell you. I'll get, get, get you some inspiration. So, so that's what he did. Ozal, he went. Ashkeche Latana, he found a Tana. Now you have to understand, a Tana here does not mean an author of the Mishnah. But the Tana here, he found a Tana means a person who repeats the Mishnahs. There used to be rabbis that knew the whole Mishnah by heart. And they would stand in front of the other rabbis and they would repeat the Mishnahs that they knew by heart. And the other rabbi would expound upon it. So these rabbis knew it word for word. So they knew the exact wording. And the other rabbis would expound on their, you know, on their, uh, the other rabbis would expound on their, um, on their teachings. So this is the Tana. So he went to this base Medrash down the road. 
and he found the Tana the Katani Kamei the Rabbi Yechanan that was uh, teaching in front of Rabbi Yechanan, uh, Kara, and he said the following statement: Kara Vita. If a person read the Shema and he made a mistake, he doesn't know where he made the mistake. So the, the law is, there's a little change in the version on the side here. He should go back to the beginning. If he's in the middle of a chapter, now, he should return to the beginning of the chapter. Bain Perak Le Perak, if he's in between two chapters and he doesn't remember where he was, Yachzer Le Perak Rishon, he should go um, back to the uh, to the end of Perak Rishon, um, uh, uh, which means or the first pasuk of the second paragraph. He should go back to the beginning of the second paragraph because we're not sure if he said the third paragraph or the second paragraph. You know, if he, if he finished the first paragraph, if he finished the second paragraph, we should assume he just finished the first one. And go back to the beginning of the second paragraph. Being ksiva laksiva, he's not sure if he said the first uchsavtam or the second uchsavtam. He doesn't know um, which one, the first chapter of Shema or the second one, there's the same word, and he's not sure which one he said. So yachzer laksiva rishayin, he should go back to the first one in order to fulfill his obligation of reciting the entire Shema, and if he's not sure where he was, he should, uh, he has to go back to make sure he says it properly. So, Amr Alei Rabbi Yechanan, and Rabbi Yechanan said, after the Tana said this law, so Rabbi Yechanan, who was uh, sitting there in the base Medrash, he was the, the rabbi of that base Medrash, like Shanu, we didn't learn this law, Pasach, Yirbu Yimechem. This all applies if he didn't start saying Laman Yirbu Yimechem, in order that your days be lengthened. If he started saying, Laman Yirbu Yimechem, and then he's thinking, you know, I'm not sure if I said the second paragraph of the Shema or if I was in the first paragraph of the Shema, but he already said, Laman Yirbu Yimechem, Avot Pasach, but Laman Yirbu Yimechem. But if he started saying, Laman Yirbu Yimechem, Sirchei Nakat, he took his, um, what he's accustomed to, va'asi, and he continued. Asa ba'amar lahu. So he went. Uh, this Rebbe Reb, Lazar, who's about to get married, he comes and he tells the, these rabbis. He came and he told these rabbis what he learned. Amrule, they said to him, even if we only came for this thing, Dayeno, it would have been enough. In other words, we came for your wedding, we traveled all the but even just to hear this word of Taira would have been enough. What was the, what was they so impressed with? So the truth of the matter is there's two ways of learning this Gemara. I learned it the most common way that's mentioned in Shulchan Aruch, and that is that it is common for a person to drift off. It's so common that the Gemara here talks about it. In the middle of Shema, people drift off. And people forget if they said the first paragraph or if they said the second paragraph. And then you're not sure where you are. So the, the simple thing is you go back to where you're sure you, you said. So if you are not sure where you are, go back to the beginning. If you're, um, you finished the chapter, you're not sure if you finished the first chapter or the second chapter of the Shema, so what should you do? Go back and start the second chapter again, because you might not have said the second chapter, right? Obvious. Uh, so that's easy. You're in the middle of the second chapter, and you don't know where you were, and you just drifted off, and now you don't know where, but you know you're in the middle of the second chapter, you just don't know where. What should you do? Go back to the beginning of the second chapter, the beginning. How about you're in the middle of the third chapter, you're not sure where you are, but you drifted off. Go back to the beginning of the third chapter. You know, each chapter, wherever you are, that's pretty obvious. These laws seem to be pretty, pretty, pretty simple. But the next law is what's unique. This, this law is that you said the word of Sabtam, and you're not sure if you said it from the first chapter or the second chapter. So you're either at the end of the first chapter or you're at the end of the second chapter. So the law is, the obvious law is go back to the end of the first chapter, because that you for sure, you know, you... You, you, you definitely be safe if you go back to the end of the first chapter. But the unobvious law is 
what happens if you continued with the continuation of the second chapter? You were continued, and that's when you woke up and said, you know what? I don't know if I said the second chapter or not. Maybe I only said the first chapter. But, you're con but you already co had continued reciting the next sentence that only follows in the second chapter. You didn't, you didn't say the sentence that follows the first chapter. You started saying the sentence that follows the second chapter. So what is the Gemara saying? And this is what's so unique, that because you are accustomed, you said it, we assume you said it the norm what you're used to. You, we assume that you continued saying the way you're used to. So if you already said, probably because you were up to there. In your mind, you're not sure where you were. But your mouth knew where you were. Your mouth was reciting it the way it's used to saying it. So we're allowed to rely on it. That's, what, that's what's unique about this statement. And that's what they said. Wow, that's impressive. That because uh, you, you started saying, Laman Yubayimechem, that allows you to, uh, to rely. Uh, you're allowed to rely on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on, that, uh, on that point. Okay, we're going to continue with the Mishnah. The next Mishnah says, The Umnen are the, um, the, the they are the the people who are picking the 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 the, uh, the the picking the fruits at the top of the trees. And the question is, um, do they have to uh, go down in order to to daven and say shema? Do they have to come down or can then they, while they're standing on these branches on high up, can they, um, can they, uh, can they just, uh, you know, say it there? So the Mishnah says, The Umnen, these people that are busy, normally it would say, It's interesting that the Gemara uses the, the, the word, the, uh, the craftsman. But it, 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 the Poyalin would be more like these, uh, the workers who are, but they're, anyway, they're standing on the top of the tree and Baraisha Nidbach, the top of the wall. And the law is, Masha, they can say, Ho'omnen Kairin, they read the Shema, Baraisha Ilan, on the top of the, of the tree, Baraisha Nidbach, and on the top of the wall. Masha Ain Rashayin last with Cain, but they're not allowed to do that, but Tfila for Davening. So then they're not allowed to do it for Davening. Davening needs Kavana, needs more intent. And um, if, you're, if you're standing on one of these places, you're more nervous. And because you, you can't really stand there um, uh, comfortably, you're, you're, uh, you're stressed. And Rabbi? because you're nervous, you won't be able to have the right intent. But for Shema, you don't need to have that level of intent. And therefore, you would be allowed to say Shema uh, there. And the Gemara will mention the idea, the, the, the concept of the fact that also these workers are getting paid and therefore, they have to take that into consideration that if we obligate them to go down, and they're also going to cause their, their boss a loss, and therefore, that also is, a, is something to take into consideration. In other words, did the rabbis obligate them to do, so, to do that much? Yes. Rabbi, is it possible that the Gemara really uses the word umanim? I think umanim are more expert. And maybe if they're more expert in, in working, then it's okay that they can say it because they can concentrate better than just regular workers. Uh huh. You're saying they they have uh, uh, experience in studying hard and concentrating okay. because they became they they accomplished something. They have their PhD or their uh, their masters. So they've. Uh, is that is that more or less what you mean? Like they're like professionals? Well, maybe they're just more expert at the work. They're more expert at uh, putting up the wall or, or or whatever they're doing here. Um, well, I, I don't know if they're actually doing work while they're saying shema. It's all about coming, climbing down. You know, it takes time to climb down a tree, a big tree. And so the issue oh. here is we're not thinking that they're going to- The gonna issue work. is time? Is the time that they're going to come down 
and then go all the way back up. And uh, I mean, even these, I even the machines takes time. You know, even if you have one of the uh, cherry pickers, you know, it takes time till you navigate yourself in between the uh, the things. But imagine if you had to climb down. Uh, you know, it, it's it's uh, it's crazy the, the amount of time it would take to climb down and to go up. And so, uh, okay. you know, that's what I we're thought doing. it was a matter of concentration rather than time. Right, but it's concentration on not <laughs> while you're working. In other words, you're not doing work while you're standing. That's concentration because. The issue is that you might fall where you are. That's one issue. And time coming down. In other words, there's two issues here, but it, but it's not about doing work and Shema at the same time. Okay. I see. Okay, thank you. Uh, at, least, uh, at least so far, that's my understanding. Yes, Ezra. Um, in the old days, you were paid for a day's work. You weren't paid to daven. And so therefore, in order to give your uh, your boss, the amount of work, you couldn't take the time off to climb down the tree and then climb back up because that's lost and lost, that's lost time, which the, your boss would still have to pay for. So therefore, the, the rabbis made it, uh, you know, allowed that you could say the kiyachma while you were still in the trees. But I think the point of the artisan over here is that you have to be a very knowledgeable of where to stand because, you know, especially in the branches of the trees, sometimes those branches can't hold you. And so you have to know where to step uh, in order not to fall, not to have the branches break on you or whatever. And that might be the reason why they use the word umanim, uh, you know, in the, in the Mishnah. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I'm looking, just looking to see if anyone talks about it. Um, I don't see any commentary there about this. Why it should be I, I don't know. I can't hear. But I, the only thing that I'm thinking is that there's two, there's two cases here. There's people on top of a tree and people on top of a wall. So it could be the umnen is because there's people on top of a wall. On top of the wall, these are, these are craftsmen. They're working on, on building. The people, maybe the people on top of the tree are, are picking fruits. So maybe that's the, uh, maybe it uses umnen because of the people on top of the wall. Maybe they were doing more, more building and uh, therefore they're considered more craftsmen. But in any event, uh, the, issue, the issue is concentrating while, while you might fall and time. So on the one hand, we would like you to go down so you'll concentrate. On the other hand, going down will remove, will, will, will be a cost to the owner. And so the rabbis had to make a decision as to when a person would be obligated to go down and when not. Yes, Ben. When you need to cut down a big tree, you have to start from the top. Uh -huh. You cut uh -huh. down the top branches first. Uh -huh. So you're saying so maybe- it the... doesn't matter whether they are cutting trees or whether picking fruit. You know? Right, okay. Just It's just interesting that it used that term, but you're saying maybe the people on top of the tree are, are not really picking fruit. They're really cutting down the tree and you would call that a, a more of a craftsman rather than a, uh, just a worker. Okay. Maybe. Um, right. think, yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Sounds, sounds, uh, sounds okay. Yeah. Um, okay. The next Gemara is a Gemara. The next mission, the next piece of the Mishnah is something we've learned before. Um, it says, a chasan, a groom, is exempt from saying Shema the first night because we mentioned earlier that he's busy. His mind is overwhelmed with the mitzvah that he's about to accomplish and, and he has, he's nervous and so on, so he's exempt from, the, um, from Shema until Maitzei Shabbos. God, Maitzei Shabbos, and Lai Osa Maisa if he did not have relations. And he gets uh, until Maitzi Shabbos uh, uh, to, to be exempt from Shema if he still hadn't um, uh, completed, if he still hadn't uh, had relations with his, with his new wife. But after that, he doesn't get any more exemption. And uh, normally uh, the, the custom was to get married on a Wednesday night. So he had four nights that he was exempt from Shema, Wednesday night, Thursday night, and um, 
Friday night. No, three nights then. Wednesday night, Thursday night, and Friday night. I need and another this, piece of paper. You're so stingy with it. Until my t- oh, well, until my t- Shabbos maybe means including my t- Shabbos. The odd my t- Shabbos. I'm not sure if that includes my t- Shabbos Saturday night or not. Uh, I think it says that he gets four nights. So if it's four nights and it includes Saturday night and he's exempt until the next morning, oh, uh, Sunday morning. Also, uh, Misa Rebbe Gamliel. And there's a story of Rebbe Gamliel. The Nasa Isha, he married a woman, Bekara Laila Harishina, and they and he said Shema the first night. So what's the uh what, how, how could he why did he say Shema the first night? Uh the students were all wondering, I'm to Amidav. His student said to him, Limaratanu Rabbeinu, our master taught us that a chasan is exempt from Shema. Amar Lahem, he said to them, Aini Shame Lachem. He said to them, I'm not listening to you to uh, abolish from myself the acceptance of the yoke of heaven, even for one moment. So what does this mean? So Tysus over here says, what type of story is this? It sounds like it's contradicting the halacha, the law. The Mishnah said a law that you're exempt. And then the Gemara said, then the Mishnah says a story with Rebbe Gamaliel. He said Shema, and he answers a very like uh, 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 strong, a very uh, bold answer. Oh, I'm not, uh, I'm not going to listen, uh, you know, not to, not to, not to accept the yoke of heaven. How could I, how could I not accept the yoke of heaven? So, huh. so, so Tyson says, he says, Tyson says it's not a contradiction the story because what it's telling us is that if a person is great and it has confidence in himself that he'll be able to have kavana, he'll be able to have the right concentration and, um, and he's fit to, to do that, um, uh, he's, he, 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 he's allowed to. He's allowed to uh, say Shema, even though he's exempt. That's what the mission is really telling you. That yeah. At that level, he's allowed to. It's not a contradiction. Is he exempt? Yeah. But if a person's on the level that he can concentrate and he's, you know, fit to, to take that uh, title that he's, uh, uh, that, you know, that he's going to say Shema, uh, Rabbi Gamliel, you know, so then he's, he's, he's able to, uh, uh, he, he's allowed to. Um, nowadays, this halacha doesn't apply because no one has so much concentration. So even a person who gets married, they daven myriv and they say Shema because their concentration, even though they're nervous, uh, they're uh, concerned, or their their mind is confused, they're overwhelmed. They will uh, have, uh, they will, you know, their their shema is no worse than everyone else's. We're all we, people don't have the same concentration as uh, as we have uh, as people used to have. Um, okay, Tanara Banan, the rabbis learned. The workers they say shema in the top of a tree and top of a wall. And um, a, a, a nidbach is a stone wall. And on top of a olive tree or a, a fig tree, they're able to even say Shemana Esri. And the reason why is because there's a lot of leaves and they're not stressed, it's not uh, tight. Uh, they're not afraid they'll fall. And therefore, they can daven on top of them. Other trees you would not be allowed to daven on, but you would be allowed to say Shema. The other trees, they go down and they daven. And what about the owner of the of the field? So the owner, he doesn't have necessarily the same leniency as the workers. The rabbis were lenient for the workers in order for the owner to want to hire them. In order for the owner to want to hire them, the uh, the uh, in, the, in order for them to for the owner, um, you know, to feel that he got his day's work. 
So th- there was certain leniencies, but Balabayas, the owner, no matter what type of tree, he should go down and daven. Um, and because his mind is not fully, is not completely miyushav, um, uh, relaxed on him. Uh, and even though we were lenient for the workers uh, because of the uh, time that they're going to lose, but we weren't lenient for the owner. To, to, uh, instead, he has to come down for all trees, even an olive tree and a fig tree to Dava. Rabbi, Rabbi uh, yes. Um, and the uh, Stein Zaltz Gemara, he, he brings from the Talmud Yerushalmi, it says that not only these particular trees have numerous branches, which make them safe to stand on, but also because of the numerous branches, it makes it particularly difficult to climb up and down and tend to them. And therefore, not only is it much harder to get up and down than regular trees, but there's also the concern that the branches will break because of the numerous climbs up and down on these trees, and then you're going to damage the trees that belong to the owner. Uh huh. Interesting. Okay, Rashi doesn't mention that. That's interesting. Uh huh. Very nice. Thank you uh, for bringing that up. That's an interesting, uh, interesting point. Okay, so the the, uh, the 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 Gemara continues. We're on the second wide line. Rami le Rav Meri, bere de mas bas Shmuel le Rav. So Rav Meri, the son of Bas Shmuel, said to Rav, Tanan, we learned in a Mishnah. We, we, this is an interesting person. This uh, this Rav uh, um, Rav Rav Mary Bereid Shmuel. So Rashi brings down that in many places um, he's called the son of Rachel, um, and she Rachel was the daughter of Shmuel. She was she was captured by the Goyim, and a non-Jew had relations with her, and. Um, and afterwards, he became Jewish, and his name was Isser. And Rav Meri was the son, and he was conceived from a non-Jewish father. Um, and therefore, he's not called from the son of his father's name. He's called the son of Bas Shmuel, the son of the daughter of Shmuel. So uh, he was bur- born to Jewish parents, but he was conceived, uh, he was conceived uh, in a, in a, you know, from when, when his father was not Jewish. So in any event, this Rav, Rav Meri, the son of the daughter of Shmuel, he said to ask a question on, to Rav, to Nan, we learned in the Mishnah, we learned, that the Umnin, they can say Shema in the top of a tree, in the top of a, of a wall. Alma loy boy kavana. We see that you don't need to have kavana. You don't need intent. And the Gemara is understanding this to mean that you could even work while you are doing, while you're saying Shema, like uh, uh, we initially understood, uh, I'm sorry, like uh, Howard understood. And I'll ask a contradiction. A person who says Shema has to have Kavana. So how could you do work while you're while you're saying the Shema? Shema Shema Yisrael it says Hero Israel. Yisrael. And further it says Haskes, uh, be attentive and hear Israel. Afghan Just like over there, you have to attempt, be attentive. Here also you have to be attentive. And how could so therefore you have to have Kavana? 
So Ishtik, he was quiet. Did you hear anything about this? So Rami, uh, I'm sorry, Rav Meri said, uh, this is what Rav Shesha said, that um, they are allowed to be mavatel from their work and say Shema, but um, so, so, so the the answer that he's giving is that they are allowed to uh, uh, be mavatel that they should say Shema with kavana. They're able to be mavatel from their work. So that's the uh, the uh, that's the next uh, thought of the Gemara. But then the Gemara says v'hatanya. But we learned in a brisa Basil says you do work while you're reading it. So the Gemara says like kasha have a have a sheni. It's not a kasha. It depends if it's in the first paragraph or the second paragraph, or some want to learn at the first pasuk and then afterwards. It's a difference of opinion, um, but basically, for the initial sentence of the Shema, you cannot work while you're saying the Shema, and uh, for what for the for the later part of the Shema would not be a problem. So that's the uh, so the main question is, you know, was how do you say Shema in the first place? You have to, you're working while you're saying Shema. The answer is no, you're actually not working, at least during part of the Shema, that you have to have special concentration. You're not working during that part of the Shema. Okay, we're going to stop here. I want to wish all of you a very good Shabbos, and I will see you in Mitzvah Shem on Sunday. Thank you, Rabbi. Good Shabbos. Shabbos, Rabbi. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi.